Okay. And there will be um, a number of places in this presentation refer to something and say, this is, uh, this is something that could be a, a, an, an, its, its own subject for um, its own training. Um, and I won't be and necessarily be able to go into much detail on it, but just, just to flag that it's, it's a fairly broad area and we're gonna largely stick with, with filing an answer. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, get started. So if you're familiar with the unlawful detainer process, um, yeah, I'll, I'll just give you the, the quick and dirty basics. It's a way for a landlord to forcibly eject a tenant through the legal process from um, their home. Generally, what I'll be dealing with is residential tenancies, although largely um, it's a similar process with just less defenses for commercial tenancies. Um, so the unlawful detainer process, in a nutshell, in 99% of circumstances, a landlord will first serve a notice on a tenant. Um, and that usually that notice will give the tenant a choice, either to comply with the notice or to leave the premises. Um, at that point, then it, it falls to the tenant to decide what they're going to do. If they comply with the notice, uh, it never, it never unlawful detainer. But assuming that the tenant is either unable or unwilling to comply with the notice, once the, the notice period has expired, the landlord can then, under normal circumstances, immediately then serve a summons and complaint. I'll give you the caveat that depending on your jurisdiction and if you've got a local moratorium, um, there might be some controls on whether or not a landlord can file certain types of evictions. Um, for example, I'm in Alameda County and all non-payment evictions are in abeyance until the moratorium is lifted. Um, and a landlord has to essentially file a motion to get permission to, to serve a summons and complaint that meets one of the exceptions to the moratorium. But when we get, let's say we've gotten to the point, the, the tenant was unable to comply with the notice um, and the landlord served an eviction a, a summons and complaint for an unlawful detainer or an eviction on them. That's what we're gonna be dealing with today. What is the tenant's immediate response and how can we help these tenants out? So the most important thing to know in these situations is a tenant only has five days to respond to a complaint if they're personally served. And in the bulk of situations, a tenant will be personally served. Um, that's the, the statutory requirement. However, there is an exception if a landlord attempts several times to serve and they can't serve the person for whatever reason, they can request um, permission to leave from the court to serve by posting and mailing where they post the actual summons and complaint on the door and also mail them a copy. And that extends the period in which the tenant has to, to file a response. But for all intents and purposes for us, most of these cases are gonna be, there, there's going to be personal service that starts the clocks. Starting the next day, assuming the next day is, is not a holiday or a weekend, the clock runs down and the tenant only has five days to file an answer. And fortunately, the law was changed several years ago. So now weekends and holidays don't count against this. Um, used to be the landlord's favorite trick would be to serve an unlawful detainer complaint late on a Friday um, to get the clock running, knowing that they're gonna burn their first two days on the weekend when legal services organizations aren't open. Um, and available to help tenants file an answer. But now, fortunately, we've got five business days, essentially. Now, there are four ways a tenant can respond to a complaint. We're only going to be dealing with one of them today, actually filing an answer, but I just want to sort of put you on notice that there are other things. So in the, the vast majority of these circumstances, we're going to be helping a tenant file an answer. Technically, there are also motions that a tenant could file, a motion to quash based on improper service, um, a motion to strike if there's something improper in the complaint um, or a demur. Um, and in these situations, particularly the motion to strike and the demur, you're not actually filing an answer at the same time. You're filing this motion. And if you lose the motion, you then have five days to file your answer. But what we're going to be deal with, dealing with today is we've got a tenant who's come in. We don't have time to help them draft a motion. So we're going we're gonna to work on filing an answer for them. So that's where we're at. Why do we file the answer? It's to present a default judgment. If we, if the tenant does not file within those five days, on the starting on the sixth day, if the landlord gets to the courthouse first and files a default, that cuts off the ability of the tenant to file an answer. And then when the landlord applies for the default judgment, they will get a writ of possession and that starts the clock for the sheriff to show up and evict the tenant. So we're in a situation where we're racing against the clock 
we've got to help them fill out a fairly complicated legal document and get it filed with the court um, before the, these five days end. So what are we going to do? Well, we're filing our answer, which responds to the, the plaintiff's complaint. Um, and there's sort of two broad areas where we're going to be answering. So we're going to be either admitting or denying the allegations that are made by the plaintiff um, in the complaint. This is, this is our defense, right? This is our, the answer serving as, as a shield. Like we are getting in there and we're saying, no, everything that the landlord says is not true. We, 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 in fact, they're not in violation of their lease. And, and you know, perhaps the landlord is not actually the landlord. We're going to deny as many of the allegations as we can legitimately do. Independently, we'll also be raising our affirmative defenses. And this is our shield. So this is our, our affirmative defenses. And we'll talk about this in a little more detail. Our um, pleadings that we can make, arguments we can make, where even if you take all of the plaintiff's complaint, all the allegations is true, we can still win if we can carry the burden to show our affirmative defenses. And then finally, the last thing an answer is going to do is request other relief. Um, we may be, we're going to be requesting a jury trial. We might be requesting attorney's fees or a court reporter, um, and we'll talk. So what are we doing when we prepare an answer? Well, the first thing we're going to need to, obviously, hopefully the tenant has a copy of the summons and complaints. Um, and as, as we'll talk in a little more detail, the, the summons and complaint, the complaint is largely going to be based on a notice, a notice to quit. And we'll talk about the various types of notices to quit. So the first thing you're going to look at in the complaint is the notice, because this is where most cases are won or lost. Um, because unlawful detainers are um, an expedited process, you know, they, we, this is not normal. You don't have 30 days to file an answer. You've got five days to file an answer. This is probably going to, under normal pre-COVID times anyway, go from filing to being set for trial within a month, maybe two months. So what landlords trade for that is they have to completely follow all statutory procedures. And any deviation from these procedures or defects in these procedures is enough to get a case dismissed so they can start over again. So that's, that's why notices matter. If they fail to comply, and there are a lot of different requirements um, from a number of different sources, the federal level, the state level, local level, both city and county, um, have certain requirements about what has to be in these notices. And if there are things that are left out, uh, we can get the entire lawsuit thrown out based on a motion, which is great. So the notice, it's first step in the eviction process, right? The landlord is gonna serve a notice in most cases before they can actually file the unlawful detainer. It's gotta be properly served on the defendant. Um, and as I said earlier, the notice has to strictly comply with the various legal requirements. Now, where are these legal requirements gonna come from? Well, there are a variety of sources of law. So there are certain state requirements that are, that are set up in California state law um, at, that, that govern you know, most of the unlawful detainer process. Um, and that's gonna include what goes in the notice, what has to be there, um, what allegations need to be made, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's also statewide just cause for eviction now in California. So you're, we're gonna be looking at whether the, the property um, is actually under the sit under the just cause jurisdiction or whether they, they're exempt from just cause. Um, but that's not the end of our analysis. We're also going to look at local ordinance requirements. So there are many cities across California that have their own just cause for eviction standards. And most of these just cause ordinances um, will oftentimes require different things that have to be in the notice. So for example, in Oakland, there is a statutorily required paragraph that advice is available from the rent board and has to include the, the address of the rent board, the phone number, and the website address. And if that's left out, you're in violation of the Oakland ordinance, the notice is therefore defective, and the unlawful detainer um, cannot proceed if, if, if you argue this is a motion. Um, there can also be county requirements in Alameda County. So for example, if I have a tenant from Oakland, I'm looking at the state law, I'm looking at Oakland's just cause for eviction ordinance. I'm also looking at the, the implementing regulations of the just cause for eviction ordinance. And oftentimes you can find some really good stuff there um, that, that creates additional requirements that often, oftentimes landlord attorneys you know, might not do the research that far, particularly if that's not their main you know, area of specialty. If they're just doing it sort of an eviction on the side, there are a lot of spaces where they can make a mistake. But in addition to looking at the Oakland laws and state laws, there's a county moratorium. That county eviction moratorium right now requires another 12 point font statement within the notice that's, that you know, puts the, the tenant on notice that there is an eviction moratorium 
It also requires that a copy of the moratorium be attached to the notice as well. So if a landlord or landlord attorney fails to do any of these things in the notice, that's going to give you grounds to for a motion for summary judgment or a motion for judgment on the pleadings, and you're going to be able to get the case dismissed. But that's still not where our analysis ends because you also have federal law. Um, for most of us who are working in this field, we're working with low income tenants, a lot of whom um, are in subsidized units. They're, they have Section 8 housing choice vouchers or they have project based Section 8, or perhaps they're in um, LIHTC, low income housing tax credit units. And all of these types of units have additional federal requirements on top of the state requirements, on top of the local ordinances of what needs to be in a notice, perhaps of how much time needs to be given in the notice. Um, a great example of this is the Violence Against Women Act. Any federally subsidized tenancies, the notice to quit that is served upon the tenant has to also include a copy of the Violence Against Women Act and their rights under it. And if that's not attached, you know, I'm just going to sound like a broken record, but that's going to be our basis to get this case dismissed, um, which is awfully, awfully nice thing to do. Now, let's talk a little bit about the state law requirements. And again, I'm not going to get in, into a ton of detail on notice defects. There's, there's more information in the slides than I'm going to go into, but just know this is an incredibly fertile area for being able to win your We have three-day notices to pay rent or quit. Um, we've got three-day notices to cure or quit, right? You, you're violating your lease and you need to stop violating the lease, or you have a particular obligation under the lease you're not doing, you need to start doing that within three days or get out. Um, there are three-day notices simply to quit that aren't stated in the alternative. Generally, these involve um, higher-level nuisances, and, and the state has determined that some things are so bad that the tenant doesn't get a chance to, to, to make things right. They just have to go. Um, Fortunately, a couple of years ago, we passed AB 1482, um, which sets up largely statewide just cause, although there are properties that, were, that are exempt from just cause. But for the properties that are exempt, um, you can see 30 and 60 day notices to terminate tenancy. These are no cause notices. They, all they say is your tenancy is over and they, they don't have to say a reason at all. Um, and then finally, under some subsidized tenancies, there are also 90 day notices to quit. So just go, you know, as an example, three-day notice to pay rent or quit, you know, take a look at all these things. If any of these things are not there in the notice, the notice is defective and we can win the case. So it has to be in the alternative, right? You can't say you haven't paid your rent, so you got to get out. You got to give them the alternative to pay or quit. Um, it has to demand the exact amount of rent that's lawfully due at the time. This means literally I have won cases where they overstated the amount of rent due by a dollar. Um, and that is a defective notice because they're not, they're not required, they're not uh, complying with all statutory requirements. Also, it can only demand rent. You can't demand late charges in a, in a three day notice to pay rent or quit or utilities or any other sorts of charges. Um, you can't demand rent from a period of time over a year before service of the notice. So you, all you can evict for under normal, normal times. Now we've got some obviously state law that, that's governing what's gonna happen with non-payment cases going forward, but generally you can't go back farther than a year in time for rent. And then finally, a lot of specific information that has to be included. The name, phone number, and the address of person to whom the rent must be paid, the days and hours where the rent can be accepted if it can be paid in person. And if you leave off a single one of these things, if you leave off the phone number, defective notice and you can get this case dismissed. Likewise, three-day notice to cure or quit. Same thing, it's gotta be worded in the alternative and you've gotta give the tenant time to, to get in compliance with their lease. Then you've got your three-day notices to quit um, that have no, no opportunity to cure. Um, and these are based on California Code of Civil Procedure 1161.4. And they're based on an allegation, essentially the tenant has violated a covenant such that that violation is a non-curable breach. So Non-curable breaches tend to be nuisance. It tends to be your biggest biggest one. Using the premises for an unlawful purpose. A lot of times, if you're if if you've got a tenant who's been uh, you know accused of selling drugs out of their apartment, for example, they're not going to get a chance to um, to to fix that. There, there's no opportunity to cure. Um, it's been widely determined that illegal subletting is an uncurable thing, right? The idea being, if you're subletting to someone, there's no way you can get them out within three days because you would have to evict them. So they can they don't give you the opportunity to cure that. Um, and there's a lot of case law that extends this to Airbnb, which is interesting because conceivably 
you could be renting to someone for two nights for Airbnb and you actually could cure that. You could stop renting out on Airbnb altogether, but um, law hasn't caught up with that. So that still is generally considered to be a non-curable breach. Um, and again, minimum time period for the notice is three days. You've got 30 and 60 day notices where you don't have to have cause if the tenancy is not covered by either a local just cause for eviction ordinance or statewide just cause. Um, it, although the, even, even here, um, these notices that you must, they, the landlord must include language about the tenant's rights to recover their unclaimed possessions once they've been evicted. This is under, I believe, the California Code of Civil Procedure, or California Civil Code 1940.6. So if they leave that information out, it's a defective notice and you can, you can still win the case. And then finally, there are certain um, Section 8 vouchers and other subsidized tenancies where that require a 90 day notice to quit. Oftentimes for subsidized tenancies, the lease itself creates additional protections where maybe the, the tenant might be entitled to a grievance hearing before a notice to quit can be served. So if the, if the landlord doesn't comply with every level of this, and you know, at this point, you know, if we, let's say we've got someone looking in a subsidized tenancy that has particular lease requirements um, and we're under a county moratorium and you're also looking under state law, that's five different places a landlord has to go to ensure that their notice is legally compliant um, and can support an eviction. So lots of areas for landlords to make mistakes. And that's what we as tenants rights attorneys um, oftentimes will capitalize on. So you've looked at your notice first. That's, that's where we're, we're gonna be getting a lot of, lot of our defenses. You're also gonna review the complaint, obviously. Um, and landlords have two ways to do this. They can, there is a California Judicial Council form that probably most landlords use, not all, um, but a landlord can also um, just draft their own complaint on pleading paper. Um, so, you know, maybe, you know, maybe you'll be, you'll, if you're doing this regularly, you will see these, these forms all the time. It's, I kind of like it when they use the judicial council form because you know what to expect there and you, you know what to look for, what the allegations they're going to make, they're going to be making and what you need to challenge. But, you know, like I said, there are some law firms um, that do a lot of work throughout California and, you know, probably just because they've always done it that way, they draft them from scratch um, and don't use a judicial counsel. E either way is fine. Now, we're going to be sitting down with a tenant and keep in mind, we're under a tight time frame, right? We've got five days to file an answer starting the day after they were served. And you all know if you're doing this work, it's very rare that we get a tenant in on that very first day. It's probably going to take them a while to get to us. So, Maybe we're there coming in on day two, day three, day four, maybe even day five. We're at like really under the gun. We've got three hours to get something filed, or they're they're going to get a default. The landlord's going to get a default judgment. So we need to do a very quick intake. Um, what I tend to like to do, if the tenant can do this, has the technological savvy, is have them send me the documents first, so I can sort of get a jump on it and start looking at the complaint, looking at the notice. But sometimes the first time you're going to see it is when the tenant uh, walks in the door. And sits down with you. So we're going to review the complaint with the with the tenant. We're going to say, hey, the, you know, here are all the allegations they're making. Which one of these things do you think are false? Which one of these things do you think are true? And then which one of these things do you not have a basis to decide whether it's, it's true or false? And that's going to provide the basis for how we help them draft their answer. Quite a few uh, required allegations and unlawful detainer complaints, um, and you know the reason that landlords were well, they've done this judicial council is like the judicial council form has all the requirements right there. If they just fill it out properly, they're going to be ahead of the game as far as as making the required allegations. But oftentimes, particularly with pro per landlords who are working without the assistance of counsel, um, you're still going to see mistakes here. But they've got to demand possession. Um, they've got to add. You know, it can't just be the street address, but if it's a unit, the unit number needs to be there. It's got to state the grounds for the eviction. Um, the terminated, termination notice needs to be attached. They need to talk about how they serve the notice. They need to allege that there's a landlord-tenant relationship. You might be surprised at the number of complaints I've seen where the, the landlord, when, particularly when they don't have an attorney, forgets to allege a landlord-tenant relationship, and that results in a defective complaint. That's not nearly as good for us as effective notice because a landlord or landlord attorney can always amend the complaint to fix those problems. But 
you know, we want to go through and, you know, try to try to deny as many of these things as we can. Now, how do we do that? Well, one thing I'd like y'all to do, I, I, I didn't, um, I didn't have an answer that I can bring up. If we've got enough time at the end of the presentation, I'll bring one, bring one up when I'm done with the, the PowerPoint and talk in a little more detail about it. But first thing you'll note, if you, if you do look at this, and this is UD uh, slash 105, it's a judicial council form. Um, first thing you're going to notice on the top right is the, the you know, the caption, the, the name of the, the, the attorney or the party without an attorney. That's going to be your first decision. I know generally in our practice, unless we have a pre-existing relationship with a tenant, we're probably going to draft the answer for them in pro per. So it'll be under the tenant's name and address as opposed to our organizations. And then we will present the case at case rounds and decide whether we have the capacity to take it, uh, run conflicts checks, that sort of thing. But Maybe this maybe this is the second UD where you know we just got the previous UD um, bounced on a notice defect, so the landlord served a new one. And since we have the pre-existing relationship with the client, maybe we'll file the answer directly under our name because we've already made the decision to take the case. But first, so the def the defendant has to state all defendants who are, are part of the answer have to state their name at the beginning. So if you run a, into a situation where there are multiple tenants. You've got a decision to make of whether to do a single answer for all the tenants, which they can all sign, um, but they'll also all have to verify, or you can do individual answers for individual tenants. Um, this is probably the right way to go, particularly if there's the possibility that there's gonna be conflicts between them and you're not gonna be able to represent all of the tenants. Um, that's gonna be an important thing to look at is whether even if you're preparing answers for all three tenants, does that possibly conflict you out of, of representing any of these tenants? So these are things you want to have thought about before you're doing these types of intakes. But once you've gotten past, you know, listing your defend which defendants are filing this answer, we're, we're looking at disputing the allegations. And I said, this is where we're playing defense. This is where we're at. our answer is acting as a shield. And we are saying, hey, the landlord's made these allegations. We're going to deny them. Now, there's two ways you can do this. Um, the first, and it's nice to be able to do this, is the general denial. So, and the, the, if, you, if you'll notice on number two on, on the UD-105 form, it says, do not check this box if the complaint demands more than $1,000. Um, and so what does that mean exactly? That's kind of tricky. If it's a non-payment case, it's really easy to see. If the three-day notice, you know, asks for $5,000 in back rent, clearly it's, it's demanding more than $1,000. But if it's not a non-payment case, maybe it's a lease violation case, and then the question becomes, well, they're going to be asking for holdover damages, right? You know, anytime you file an unlawful detainer, part of what they're going to say is if we win, we get the daily rent for each day from when the tenancy was terminated, you know, when we filed the notice to when we won the case. Um, does that potentially add up to more than $1,000? Maybe. But I, my general rule is that if it's not a non-payment case or it's a non-payment case and they're asking for less than $1,000, I'm going to check the, check the general denial box, which is awesome, because essentially that single box says I'm denying every single thing in the landlord's complaint. You don't really even have to start going through it at that point. You, you know, you got to sort of take easy street. But let's assume that you can't check the general denial box. Um, we're going to have to go into specific denials. And there are essentially two different types of these. So we're going to look through the unlawful detainer complaint and it's, you know, it's nice and handily numbered, you know, one through 17, I believe. Um, and you're going to go through each one of these allegations and decide whether are you denying it based on the fact that it's false. So like maybe the landlord is just flat out made up like the, you know, one of the questions, one of the, the allegations in, in the, um, in, in an unlawful detainer complaint is, is the amount of rent and landlord puts in the rent of $3,000 a month and the tenant says, no, I've always been paying two thousand dollars a month, and you're gonna, you know, chip, put the that the number of the allegation under specific denials, denial of allegations because they're false. And oftentimes we're going to be able to deny large portions of the complaint on this. You know, maybe the notice never got served on, so we're going to not deny that their allegation that their process server put the the notice on the door on thus and such a date. There are also going to be some allegations that we don't necessarily know or believe are false, but we don't know. We, we're not in a position to know whether they're true or false. If we can't deny something because we're out and out stating that it's false, we can also deny it due to no information of belief. So what would that look like? 
one part of the unlawful detainer complaint form talks about the plaintiff and it has a section the you know is the plaintiff a limited liability company or you know an s corp or you know it has a position where they can say are they a corporate entity or are they you know an individual if they say they're a corporate entity well we don't know they're lying we, they may be a corporate entity but i've also never seen the incorporation paper so if i don't have proof in front of me I can deny that allegation based on having no information or belief that it's true. So at the end of the day, we wanted anything that we can credibly deny and, and deny in good faith, either because we know it's false or because we just don't know, we want to do that. Anything that you don't deny is essentially it, it conceded as, as, as true. And that's one less thing that the landlord is going to have to prove a trial. So you're going to be going through with a tenant, you know, under, you know, two, to be denials, you know, under denials for falsity, you're going to have, par you know, allegations one, three, seven, nine, and 13. And then for allegations that we have no information or belief that the, the statements are true, so we're going to deny them. We're just going to put down, you know, allegations two, four, eight, and 12. Um, it's, you know, really simple just by the numbers, but you, you're going to need to go through with the tenant, the, ten the client to determine you know, which things you're denying and on what basis you're denying them for. Um, in addition to the, the, the denying the allegations in the complaint, now there's a new mandatory cover sheet that has supplemental allegations. The unlawful detainer forms were all updated uh, very recently, within the last month or two, um, to incorporate all of the various new defenses um, you know, at the state level, SB 91, um, anything that, that, that the state, you know, has essentially enacted due to COVID. And so there are a bunch of allegations in the cover sheet that you're also going to want to through, go through and, and either figure out if you can deny them um, or if you need to accept them. Like, yeah, you know what, the landlord actually did put this in my door. So we're not going to, we're not going to deny that. Once we've gone through that, that's going to, that's actually not going to take too terribly long, particularly if you can, if you can keep the tenant focused and, and the more familiar you are with these forms, you can go through these pretty quickly. What's going to take a little more time is going to be our affirmative defenses. And this is the part of our answer that acts as, as a sword, right? So we're going to review the notice and the complaint. Um, you know, get, we've gotten the landlord's turn side of the story. Now it's time to get the, the tenant side of the story. And, and what we're going to get from them is, hey, which affirmative defenses can we, you know, allege such that if we prove these at trial, um, we, we could win. Um, let's see, there's something in the Q&A. Um, let's see. Oh, um, in all cases that are not non-payment, yeah, you can generally safely do a general denial. I have never, I've always done that. There's a theoretically an argument that, again, if the holdover damages could at some point exceed $1,000, but I've never seen a landlord make that argument, much less a, a judge actually grant can safely do that. But it's probably best practice if, if you're not sure, you know, err on the side of caution and use, um, you know, use, use your specific denials. Um, anyway, back to affirmative defenses. So this is, a, this is our sword, right? So this is where we can say, look, every allegation in the complaint is true. Landlord is completely right. We, we haven't paid the rent for three months, but even if all of their arguments are true, here's why we still win. We have these affirmative defenses that shift the burden. We've got the burden to prove these things, but if we can prove them, it defeats the complaint, even if the complaint otherwise would have been a winning complaint. So this is kind of our, I like to refer to this as our yes, but. Yes, you know, you have an unlawful detainer case against them. They haven't paid the rent, but, you know, the reason they didn't pay the rent is because there's terrible habitability conditions. You know, the reason they didn't pay the rent or the, you know, perhaps the landlord has filed this case, but, you know, because they're discriminating against our clients. So even if the allegations in the, in the complaint are true, if they're doing it for bad motives, we can still win the case. Um, sometimes this could be dispositive and, and, you know, we, we could get, we could, you know, win a motion on it or make the argument at trial. Sometimes it might just affect the, the total overall amount of rent due. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little more detail. So, the nice thing about the new um, unlawful detainer answers is there are tons of affirmative defenses that are already built in it. Literally, you know, it, it sets up a nice checklist for you. So you're going to check boxes for a whole lot of these things. And then um, you're going to have to go a little farther than that. And we'll talk about that in more detail. But this sort of is going to point you in largely the right direction of what the most common 
defenses are. So, you know, the, one of the biggest ones for not for non-payment of rent is the breach of warranty of habitability, um, or the tenant has made repairs um, with their own money and deducted it from the rent. Um, plaintiff has waived, changed, or canceled the notice. Retaliation, discrimination. There are a lot of viewpoint um, defenses or state of mind motive defenses, where if a landlord is doing this for an improper motive, um, then that is, you know, we we can we we have an affirmative defense that we can base on that and we can win. Um, maybe they're in violation of an eviction local rent control or eviction control ordinance. Maybe the landlord has, has made some mistakes. And these things you want to familiarize yourself with, going to be enough to just check these boxes. So literally, you'll you, you, if you're looking at um, UD 105 or you look at it later. You know, we've had number number one on the file was names of all the defendants. Number two was the, all of the denials we talked about. Number three is defenses and objections. And it literally goes 3A through 3 double. Each of these is a separate independent affirmative defense. Um, and you might be able to check half, you know, half dozen of these. You might be able to check all of these. You might be able to check just one or two, but it's going to, you know, large, the bulk of your affirmative defenses are gonna be right there in the complaint, or rather in, in the answer form. Now, I'm not gonna go through a lot of detail in these answers. I think we could do an entire, tra an entire training just on the, you know, the, the, what you have to prove for the various affirmative defenses. I'm just gonna sort of hit on the highlights. So breach of warranty of habitability, right? A landlord has an obligation to maintain habitable premises. And this is a dependent covenant, right? So the obligation to pay rent follows from the landlord's provision of habitable premises. Now, the argument as to why we can use this as, a, as an affirmative defense is, think of this as a thought experiment. You have a lease agreement with your landlord. You're paying your landlord $1,000. In exchange, they're providing you habitable premises. If they don't provide you habitable premises, let's say they rented you a place and it doesn't have heat, or it's infested with bed bugs, or the windows are broken, or it doesn't have hot water, then what they're technically doing they are overcharging you with rent for rent. So it's the equivalent of them overstating the amount of rent. Due. So if we can prove that there are terrible habitability problems, even though my rent, according to my lease is $1,000, the court is gonna look at it like, well, you didn't have heat. So your rent really was $500. So if they're asking for $1,000, they're asking for too much. And that, that's, that's how we, we provide uh, the basis for that. Um, yeah, I'll talk about discrimination in just a second. Um, and yeah, some of these things are tough, right? Like, you know, our defense is that it's a terrible place to live, um, but our remedy is they get to continue to live in the terrible place. There are a couple of things. We can, we can in certain unlawful detainers, if we win on habitability arguments, um, part of our, judge, our judgment for winning this case can be a requirement that the landlord fix these things. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, what I often tell folks is like, wow, why are you fighting so hard to keep this tenant in this terrible place? It's terrible, but it's a roof over their head. And if the alternative is that they're going to be homeless on the street and possibly die on the street, that's a tough call that sometimes the tenant's going to be like, yeah, in the, in the near term, I would rather stay in this horrible place that doesn't have heat. You know, I want to make the, obviously I want to make the landlord fix the heat or the landlord's harassing me and discriminating against me based on sexual orientation or you know, my race, I, you know, obviously I want them to stop that, but it might be better for them. They might prefer, you know what, I live in this place where the landlord says these derogatory things for me because the alternative is potentially dying out on the street. And yeah, another question um, asking, yeah, when I reference winning the case, are, are the goals just to avoid the eviction until the next round? Um, that's a really good point, and that's going to differ from tenant to tenant. Sometimes when we win these cases, it's over. Like a non-payment of rent case, let's say the, the tenant genuinely fell behind on rent because they lost their job, but they now can pay rent going forward. If we can defeat this, this non-payment of rent case, either you know because the landlord screwed up, such that if they issue them a new notice, they can just pay that rent and go forward, it may never come up again. You know, They may live, go on and live a nice, happy tenancy for the next five years. But yeah, it becomes much more complicated. Let's say our defense is discrimination. Um, are, are we just trying to avoid the eviction in the next round? Sometimes that's it. Sometimes it's as simple as that. We want to keep the tenant here as long as possible until they can at least find a new place. Um, sometimes we want, well, we want to win this because if they get evicted, they lose their voucher. They've got a Section 8 voucher. Those things are as good as gold. They're, the waiting lists are insanely long. They're not always even open. 
Um, and if you have a Section 8 voucher, you're, you're, you know, you, you can pay rent, you know, that's third set pegged at 30% of your income. So maybe we want to win this kid. Winning this case might mean, yeah, we, we, we can show that the landlord's going to lose and thus we're going to negotiate a good move out agreement by which they keep their, they get their security deposit back. They have time to find a new place to accept their voucher and they don't end up losing their voucher. But sometimes it's simple, it's as simple as a victory as, hey, we've got a couple more months living in an apartment and not being, um, not. And yeah, if, if the, if the, um, if you're, you're arguing habitability is a defense, it may be, you know, there are certain circumstances where a place is completely uninhabitable. It's rare that, that a place is 100% that, but we see that. We just dealt with a case in our office where the place was so bad that the city actually, you know, inspected it and said, yeah, no one, you have to go. But in most circumstances, it's not, it's not always that bad. And, and sometimes, I hate to say this, but if the choice is, hey, I can live in this place where the heat doesn't always work, but I've got a roof over my head and the alternative might be, I've got, like, I've got nowhere else to go and I'm gonna be under an underpass um, if I don't keep this housing. Um, sometimes, sometimes a win is as simple as that. But yeah, I definitely am, am overstating a bit when I talk about winning a case, that can mean a lot of different things from preserving the tenancy forever or as, you know, forever as, as we can hope for, or you know, maybe it's just buying them enough, enough time to, until they, they'll have to file another eviction. And by that time, maybe they'll find a, a new place to move to. Or maybe they'll find a private attorney who can sue the landlord and get injunctive relief where the landlord is forced by, by the courts to, to fix everything that's wrong. But anyway, so breach of warranty of habitability, there's a bunch of good um, site, you know, a bunch of good um, ordinances and in the civil code that says exactly what habitability is. Um, land tenants can repair and deduct. So if they follow the procedure, notify a landlord they're going to fix something, spend their money to own money to fix it, they can technically deduct that cost of repair from the rent. And if that's the reason why they didn't pay the rent, they can prevail in the unlawful detainer. Some cases the landlord just refuses to. You can prove that they did that, we can win. Um, defective notices, that's our bread and butter in this field. Um, any, any violation of applicable state, local, and federal notice requirements means they're going to have to start over again. And, and this gets back to the, the question I was just asked, right? Is it really a victory if just like, hey, we've won this, but they're going to turn around and start over again? Well, in certain circumstances, yes. Sometimes the landlord will like, hey, this was too much of a fuss. I paid this attorney five grand and I lost because they made a mistake, they might not try again. Sometimes, hey, this was a non-payment of rent case, and at the time of this case, my tenant didn't have any money. But because I got this case dismissed and their, their disability check came in the next week, by the time that the landlord served a new notice, they're able to pay that rent, and it never goes to the second eviction. But again, sometimes it's as simple as like, look, they had to start over again, and this is buying my client a couple more months with a roof over their head. Um, but that's no defective notices is where we're going to win a lot of these things. And hey, maybe there's an attorney's fees clause in the lease. And winning is we just won this thing, and now we're going to go after the landlord for ten thousand dollars. And hey, maybe we we you know maybe we use that as leverage. Maybe we say, look, we won't go after these attorney's fees if you will do X, Y, or Z. You know, apply it to the their back rent balance, make certain repairs, do certain things. Another affirmative defense, the plaintiff has waived, changed, or canceled the notice. Sometimes landlords will accept payment of rent after um, they filed a UD, which reestablishes the tenancy. Sometimes the landlord will tell the tenant, hey, you know what? I sent you this notice. Don't worry about it. Um, and then they change their mind again. They're like, no, actually, I do want to go forward with the eviction. If you can prove that they did that, um, that's an affirmative defense. Um, the big two, retaliation and discrimination. Um, Landlords can't terminate a tenancies for exer tenant exercising their rights, making a complaint to an agency um, regarding habitability issues, um, participating in an organization that advocates for rights. Um, this provides a really good defense. And presumably, if you win the first UD on this, it, the landlord's going to be hard pressed to show why the second UD they filed wasn't also based on retaliation. Uh, retaliation has a basis both in the common law and civil code 1942.5. Nice thing with that is there are attorney's fees. So you can get race judicata. If you win, a, you take a UD to trial and win on retaliation. The next thing I'm going to be telling my tenant to do is, hey, go find a private attorney. 
they just got the easiest case they've ever gotten because they've already won it. They just need to file it so they can go ahead and collect. Discrimination, um, also a big one and one we see a lot. Discrimination based on a protected class is prohibited, whether it's intentional or unintentional. This can be based on um, federal law, the Fair Housing Act, um, but state law in California is actually broader and protects more classes. Um, so that's, that's a question you're always gonna ask. And it's important to know when you're going through these with the tenant, the tenant is not gonna, the tenants aren't savvy. So you don't wanna say like, well, are there, do you have any affirmative defenses in this case? You wanna interrogate them about each one. Well, do you think the landlord could be discriminating against you? Um, could the landlord be retaliated? Have you made any complaints? And you know, if, if the landlords serve this notice within six months, there is a basic presumption under the law rebuttable by the landlord, of course, but that they are they are retaliating. So you're gonna to wanna to really tease this out, even habitability. Um, I've had cases where the landlord, the tenant didn't volunteer like, hey, I don't have any heat or hey, you know, the windows are broken. So you, 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 know, you can't just ask like, hey, is there anything wrong with your apartment? I mean, I'll be, I'm sad to say there are some people and particularly the clients we've dealt with who are you know, coming up in poverty Maybe every place they've ever lived has had these problems. They, they've become normalized to them. They don't even consider this um, a habitability issue. It's just like, well, this is what apartments are like. So you, sometimes you really need to tease it out. Like, well, you know, are there any leaks? Is there mold? Uh, do you have bugs in your, in your apartment? You know, you're gonna wanna get this information from the tenant so you can uh, um, allege these defenses on their behalf. Um, the whole other possible source of um, a, an, an entire other presentation, reasonable accommodations. Um, if, you, if you have a tenant who's disabled and they've made a reasonable accommodation request, which is a request that a landlord makes certain modifications or alterations uh, to their policies um, due to accommodate for the tenant's um, disabilities. If a landlord doesn't handle this properly and they just deny it improperly, that, that is another basis for an affirmative defense. And also additionally, a lot of these affirmative defenses are also the basis for an affirmative complaint against the landlord. So if I'm alleging disability discrimination and defending a tenant in an unlawful detainer, I'm also gonna get them on the phone with the Department of Fair Employment and Housing, the state level agency that files complaints on behalf of tenants to you know, see if, they could, if they'll go after the landlord if it's truly egregious. Yeah, the, cop, the, the slides will come out, um, I think will be sent out um, by the moderator at the end of this. And so that's why I'm not going into a ton of detail, but I wanted to make sure the, the information was there. Um, violation of rent control ordinances and eviction control ordinances. Um, if you're lucky enough to be defending someone in, in, in a, a city that has just cause, there are gonna be a whole lot of requirements that need to be in the notice or need to be in the complaint. And if they, you know, if they don't comply with these things, you can get the case dismissed. And again, rent after the notice expires, you know, you'll see this, this sort of falls in, has the, the landlord waived, um, canceled or changed the notice. Sometimes if they, they take that rent check, so I always, I always encourage my tenants, hey, technically the landlord doesn't have to accept this, but go ahead and try and pay your rent. And if they are like, well, you know what, actually I kind of want this money and they cash the check, they've reestablished the tenancy and, and the UD is over. Um, there's a whole area of affirmative defenses um, if the tenant is a victim of domestic violence. Um, so, you know, make sure you interrogate that if, they've, if they're getting evicted because they called the police um, because of violence or if they, they have experienced domestic violence themselves and are being evicted for that. There's some strong defenses here. And then a lot of your sort of your generic equitable types of defenses. Um, you know, they've, the landlords violated their breach of the covenant of good faith and fair dealing. The pre covenant of quiet enjoyment, unclean hands, estoppel, right? Like the, le the landlord has, has not acted on enforcing a lease provision for years, but the, signed a lease, to, hey, no pets, but they've known you've had a pet and you've had a pet for the last 10 years. And they suddenly turn around and say, no, no, I'm evicting you for the lease violation. You can, are, you can if you can say, look, the tenant has put them, they've made a decision based on this that has put them at an at economic disadvantage that, that can be an, an affirmative defense. Likewise, very similar to a stop waiver. If the landlord has known you've been violating the lease for 10 years by doing the same thing, even if the lease, and they'll often say something where, whereby you know, a landlord not enforcing this does not mean they're waiving it. Generally, if you can prove the landlord knowingly was allowing a tenant to do something and then tries to turn around and say, oh no, you know what, you're violating the lease, I actually want you out now, uh, you can win on that.
So after you go through all of these, you've got all of these great check boxes you could do. You've checked 3A, 3E, 3F, 3G, all the way down through you know, 3M, 3P, 3Q. You're gonna have to attach a, a supplemental sheet that, that gives, you need to put a little more meat on the bones of these allegations. It's not enough to check the box. You've got to allege some facts. So it doesn't have to be a ton, but it has you have to at least, you know, get something on the record. So if you're if you're arguing habitability, for example, it's not enough to check the box in your extra um, extra attachment that you're gonna go into more detail on. You're gonna say, hey, the heat doesn't work, the windows are broken, there's mold in the bathroom and an infestation of roaches. Um, or if it's retaliation, you know, I made a complaint to the um, Oakland Code Enforcement Department. They came out and inspected, and the landlord tried to evict me two weeks later. Or the landlord is is discriminating against me based on, you know, my ethnicity or you know based on my source of income, and, and maybe a simple statement as to why that's happening. But you need to go a little further um, to allege some facts so that the landlord can't come in. I rarely see this happen, but a landlord technically can demur against an answer. Um, or file a motion to strike against an answer. And if you do, if you haven't met your prima facie burden, which is quite low, you just have to allege some facts, they could actually get some of your um, affirmative defenses stricken. Then at the very end of the unlawful detainer complaint, um, so four, so if you follow with this, number one, names of all defendants, number two, all of your denials, number three, all of your affirmative defenses. By the way, the, the affirmative defenses also include a substantial amount of defenses based on the, vari the various state laws that have been passed during COVID um, governing what can happen in terms of non-payment of rent. So there's a lot of stuff there. I'm not going to go into detail because, again, that's an entire other training on, you know, what your rights are under, um, under these various new laws that have been passed. Um, but anyway, number four is sort of like other statements, little extra things you want to allege. Um, so if you check 4A, the de defendant has maybe the defendant has already left. Like, hey, I, I, they filed this eviction against me, but I moved out. Um, and what that would do essentially would convert this to a general civil matter. It's no longer an unlawful detainer if, if uh, possession is not an issue, and it converts into a regular civil case, which then your trial date, you're looking at a couple of years down the road as opposed to, you know, two months from now. Um, 4B is where you can allege that, the, you know, the part of one of the things the complaint has to do is allege the fair market value of the property. And you might want to say, hey, that's excessive. They say that it's worth this much. Here's why I think it's not. Um, 4C is just a, a general um, catch-all other, and I like to put in here this statement, um, plaintiff has failed to meet its burden to establish a cause of action due to equitable considerations. And this we believe, and again, this is another um, example where we could do a whole other training on this. This lets us bring in equitable defenses. So things like unclean hands, thing, you know, sort of your, a lot of your traditional you know, defenses that are oftentimes used in torts and whatnot. Um, this lets you get, get some of these things in. All right, I'm gonna cut a couple of questions in here. Um, statutory habitability, statu is there a statutory definition of habitability? That's a good question. You, and if you go, uh, the, the, the PowerPoint will come out. The PowerPoint cites, I believe that California Health and Safety Code, which does go through in detail and talks about things that are required for habitable premises, um, including things like heat, uh, running water. Um, I believe the statutory law does define, you know, roach infestations, et cetera, would, would qualify under that. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it's going to be what can you convince the judge or the jury of? So even if something is not in the, the statutory definitions of habitability, you might still be able to prevail on it if you can make a good argument. I mean, kind of like a lot of areas of law, there's not really like a, a cut and dried black and white answer. It's, it's gray area where not everything is defined. So it's what can you make a compelling argument about? And then finally, number five. So again, I'm just gonna keep repeating myself. Number one, names of all defendants. Number two, all of your denials and what's in the, in the original complaint. Number three, your affirmative defenses. Number four, these other statements. Number five, defendant requests. So um, obviously the thing that's always is that plaintiff take nothing is requested of the complaint that's automatically checked that defendant requests costs that are incurred in the proceedings. So, you know, if the defendant paid a filing fee, um, they, they're entitled, if they win, they're entitled to get those costs back. Um, there's a checkbox for reasonable attorney's fees. Generally, attorney's fees are not available in unlawful detainer cases 
unless the lease pro specifically provides a pro provision that, that they do exist. And the important thing to remember about this is some leases will say, well, the landlord gets attorney's fees, but the, the tenant does not if he prevails, he or she prevails. Um, and by law, all um, attorney's fees provisions and leases are bi-directional, whether or not they're stated that way or not. So the only other way you might be able to get attorney's fees is by statute. So for example, if you're pleading retaliation under 1942.5, you might be able to get attorney's fees if you prevail on that affirmative defense. Um, uh, there's someone asked earlier, well, well what, what good does it do to win on habitability if you're going to live in a terrible place? Well, 5D your, is, gives the defendant the request that the, hab, the plaintiff be ordered, one, to make repairs and correct the, con the conditions that constitute uh, the breach of warranty to provide habitability, and that the, land, that the judge decrease the rent until those conditions are corrected. So if you plead habitability as an affirmative defense and you win on that, the judge can say, yeah, I know the lease says that your rent's $1,000, but until these, these conditions are fixed, their rent's only $500. That's all they're required to cover. And until, they, until you make these repairs, you, you can't evict them for paying, uh, not paying more than $500. Um, and so that's, that's kind of a nice thing to be able to, to get, because um, usually there's, there's not much tenants can get on, out of unlawful detainers. Usually, like, like we talk about, what you've won is you won the right to continue to pay rent to this terrible landlord. Or, you know, maybe, maybe the landlord's not terrible. Maybe it was just a simple non-payment case. But there's, you're not, you can't countersue in an unlawful detainer. Um, most tenants' remedies are going to be filing their own lawsuit, which is not expedited, which is highly unfair. Landlord can get you out in two months, but you can't get restitution for the terrible conditions they've left you in for two years because you're on the general civil track. Finally, you've got again another catch all other. This is where I like to put in everything we could possibly request. So I'm going to request a jury trial. I'm going to request a court appointed reporter at trial. There was a great Supreme, California Supreme Court case a couple of years back that establishes a right for indigent um, defendants in unlawful detainers to be provided with a court reporter. Normally, you'd have to pay for your own. Um, that way, you can, you can appeal. Um, you're, I'm going to ask for permanent masking, regardless of whether we win or lose, right? You know, in unlawful detainers, they are, they are not um, public record unless judgment is entered against you. And I'm still going to make the request that, look, even if judgment is entered against me, I, I request that this be permanently masked. And technically, that's within a judge's equitable powers. I'm going to ask for relief against forfeiture of the rental agreement, um, which is another motion, which uh, maybe if, if I come back and do a dispositive motions training, we can talk about that. Um, I'll ask for the court, California rules of court, but in our county a couple of years back, they talked about doing some experiments where they were going to do away with mandatory settlement conferences. And we think these are very effective ways to get the landlord into court, at least before COVID, where they got to be there all day and maybe they're a little pushed to, to settle in a more reasonable manner. And then finally, overall catch all any other relief that the court deems proper. Question, uh, can the rent modification for habitability be made retroactive? Yes, it can. So what, and, and this is important to know. So if a, a tenant wins a non-payment of rent case, let's say they owed three months rent at $1,000 a month and the, the judge finds, no, you should have only been paying $500. What you win is you win a conditional judgment where the judge says, all right, I'm reducing the rent. The rent should have only been 1,500, but now you've got five days to pay that back rent or the landlord ends up. Um, but but that is something they can do. Also, if you're in a rent control jurisdiction, um, a lot of local rent ordinances give you the tenant's ability to file a petition for reduced services. And if they prevail in these petitions, the local rent board has the power to say, okay, you were overpaying your rent for the last year. Now they can't, they generally don't have the power to make the landlord write a check, but what they can do is like, all right, until you work off balance, Rent is, you know, for the next 12 months is $200 a month instead of $1,000 a month until you've been compensated for that, that um, rent modification for habitability. Final, final considerations. Um, although technically um, attorneys can sign these things and conceivably under some, under, under some circumstances verify these things, I would suggest always having the tenant file the sign the answer and always having all the tenants verify the answer. And it's important if you're filing 
a single answer from multiple tenants. They've all got to sign it and they've all got to verify it under penalty of perjury. Um, let's see another question. And again, the reason for this is like generally, at least from our organization and a lot of the organizations we work with, we're, we're fill, helping fill out these answers on a pro per basis. So the tenant is filing it on, under their own name. And then if we have capacity and present the case of case rounds and there's no conflict, at that point, we'll sub into the case um, and, and take over and be the attorney of record. But you, but so you, if you use an appropriate basis, you, you clearly can't be signing it on the tenant's behalf um, or verifying it on the tenant's behalf. We're running out of time, but I've only got a couple last things to say. Um, we talked about how this is this is a mad dash, right? We, we if we're if you've got a tenant who came in on day five and you know the court you don't have e filing and the court closes in three hours, what are you going to do? What you're going to do is is have the tenant file a general denial, and what that's going to be is they're literally just going to check general denial, even if the, the general denial doesn't apply, even if it's a non-payment case, get that thing filed because you have a by right ten days in which to amend the complaint without leave of court. Judge can't tell you you can't, you don't have to ask permission for it. So what we, the most important thing in filing an answer is cutting off the ability of the landlord to take a default against your client. Because once you're defaulted, it's game over, unless you can get that default set aside, which can be a really tough thing to do. Much better to get an answer filed, even if you're not alleging any affirmative defenses, even if you're just denying one particular thing, you could deny allegation number one, and as long as you amend, file an amended answer within 10 days where you know you deny everything and you allege all of your affirmative defenses, um, that's just gonna be something that we, we have to do a lot. Then the last thing I'll say is the answer is not the only thing you're filing. Um, if you're working for low income clients, you're gonna to wanna to help them prepare a request for a fee waiver uh, because filing fees, um, I believe, all, all of our clients, uh, our income requirements are such that all of our, our clients are essentially fee waiver eligible, but I believe filing fees for a UD are now $225 a person. Um, so that can add up and that's a lot of money for someone who doesn't make a lot of money. Um, so you, you wanna file this, this request for that the court waive its fees. Um, there's a couple things in this area, right? You've got a number of boxes you can check. So if they get Medi-Cal, if they get SSI, there are about six or seven different government benefits that are sort of already means tested, right? So if you allege that you get these things, they're generally gonna grant this fee waiver automatically. What's trickier then is if you don't get any of these things, but your income is below, and, and there's a handy charts thing, if you're a family of four and you make less than this amount per month for the household, you're eligible. But you've gotta fill out that second page of the fee waiver form, which ta you know, talks about your income. And then even if you make more than their requirements, you can still request a fee waiver if you make just a little bit more, uh, but you've got to provide even more financial information. So ideally, you know, the easiest in these situations is where a, a tenant gets some sort of benefit that only, you know, only can be provided to someone who is below a certain income because those, at least in Alameda County, pretty much get, get granted outright. You're also going to make sure if you're not going to be subbing in immediately, you want the tenant to know that they they're going to need to request a jury trial. Um, and again, part of the process is once you filed your answer, the next step is the landlord can then request a set for trial. Landlord is always going to almost always going to ask to set for a court trial because it's it's going to be an hour and they're probably going to win. We're always going to want to request a jury trial because it gives us more leverage. Um, it sets the thing a little farther out. And frankly, a landlord's going to probably have to pay their landlord 10 grand or so to do a jury trial. And it makes for a nice argument. Look, why don't you just pay my client $5,000 to move instead of paying your attorney $10,000 for a trial? You're not even guaranteed to win. Um, so you want them to be ready. If they get served with a request to set trial for a court trial, they've generally got 10 days. Some, some jurisdictions um, that don't read the law, the judges think they've only got five days because they don't add five days for mailing. But you're, you've got a limited amount of time to request your jury trial. Yes, a question, can tenant e-sign and file the answer thereafter? Yes, and we have been doing that. Um, best practice would be to, to do, do something like DocuSign, or I use a, a program called Lawya, um, which has a, an electronic signature um, a, a function so that like you get a timestamp and a date stamp to prove that it actually happened. But if worse comes to absolute worse in a pinch, you can electronically sign something 
And then, yeah, I would immediately, best practice is going to be get their actual signature as soon as possible, file an amended answer that has the signatures, just so you don't get questioned on that. And, you know, if you, if you have a bad luck of the draw and get a bad judge, you might, they might ding you for that. Um, I'm terribly sorry. I meant to save more time for questions. I'm happy to stay longer um, and take more questions, um, but thanks for bearing with me um, and go out and use this knowledge for good. There's um, once the, all the rest of these moratoriums have lifted, we're looking at a veritable tsunami of evictions. So there's going to be a lot of, um, a lot of opportunity to put this, put what we've learned today in, into effect. Let's see. So yeah, please feel free if, if you guys, if anyone out there wants to ask more questions. Yes, the, I believe the, the moderator will be sending out a copy of the PowerPoint. But again, thanks again for bearing with me. A lot of information and I kind of talk, try, trying to talk fast, but hopefully being able to look at the PowerPoint, you'll be able to, to put a little more context and a little more information um, to this, these things. And yeah, just if you're in this line of work, take care of yourselves because this is really hard work. Um, it's very emotionally taxing and you can't be your best for your client if you can't take care of yourself as well. And um, for all of y'all to do this work, thank you very much. It's, um, it's really important. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. This webinar was hosted by the Legal Aid Association of California, also known as LAC. We are the membership organization for California's civil legal aid nonprofits. Our job is to advocate in the legislature, in the courts, and with the State Bar of California on behalf of the community of nonprofits that serve low income Californians. In addition to our online and in-person trainings, LAC provides coordination and advocacy for increased funding to support organizations like yours. Thank you.